All right, so today I'm actually going to give a little bit of Spark overview. For those of you using Spark, it's probably uh, you know uh, just review. Uh, but uh, I think there's some important concepts that I want to highlight before I get into the Solar and Spark integration. Uh, and then I'll walk through a couple use cases that um, that I've been working with in an open source project. Um, and then I'll actually talk a little bit about what we do uh, at Lucidworks with Fusion and Spark. Uh, and then last, I'll probably wrap up if there's time, I doubt it, I tend to ramble on sometimes, uh, about some of the other goodies that we have in this project, such as you know pulling certain vectors out of Spark to, to seed a machine learning job or uh, to do document matching. I think Grant brought that up in his key, keynote earlier. So <clears throat> a little bit about me, I'm a solar committer and uh, also on the PMC although I haven't done much with that yet, so I'm still learning what goes on there. Uh, as far as work goes, I work on the core fusion team um, and as well as, well as on solar. Uh, also co-author uh, co of Solar in Action with Trey Granger. He had a great talk earlier, so I hope you got to catch that. And then besides solar and all this stuff, I actually worked for a company down here in Austin a few years ago called the Dotches Group, and we built a social media platform on big data and that kind of stuff. Um, and um, Brett, actually, his spread fast, I think, uh, has a lot of my ex coworkers there as well. So, um, and I've been working with Spark for about a year, and I also do sort of a few things on the side, like solar on yarn, the solar scale toolkit, and solar and storm integration. So I kind of like this ecosystem around solar, and as Spark is sort of one of those. Um, I, I can't, I can pretty much spend the whole 40 minutes talking about Spark and what's cool about it and the interesting features. We don't really have time for that, but I do want to hit on some of the, the, the important topics. And um, the first is basically, Spark is very hot right now. And for the most part, you can go out on the web and find any number of presentations that really highlight all the features. But actually starting just with the, the Apache uh, homepage of Spark is a really good resource. They do a great job on documentation. And just start there. Um, and then if you really want to kind of get into the nuts and bolts and sort of the thinking behind Spark, I highly recommend this paper, which was the original one, uh, the original one out of Berkeley, where they really go into sort of some of the, the secret sauce of Spark. And even if you're not all that interested in Spark, which kind of interest in distributed data, uh, distributed systems, that's a really good read. So one of the cool things that stuck out of me when I first started learning Spark was this sort of, uh, you know, it's a lot faster and it's, it's in memory. Well, one of the things that happened is that Spark basically, and this was probably even a year ago or more, uh, broke this 100 terabyte sort record in 23 minutes, uh, in which that was actually three times faster at the time than the previous record on Hadoop that uh, Yahoo set, and uh, Spark did it on 10x less computing power. Okay? So that kind of speaks you know, at a very high level uh, that there might be something going on here. Right, uh, and at least when I saw that, I was like, okay, this, this sounds pretty good. So let me talk about the components, and that'll kind of get into uh, some of the more interesting features. So at the top here, uh, one of the things that stands out is that you actually can access Spark with these four different languages. Um, I've written maybe five lines of R in my life, so I don't really talk about that, but if you're, um, if you're, if you're a data scientist and you use R, one of the new cool recent features is that you can actually execute expensive analytics jobs from R across a Spark cluster. Um, and then also there's kind of the, the, you know, Python for those of us that are more data engineers. <laughs> uh, and then there's Java and Scala. And actually, my background is Java, but uh, really Scala is kind of the, um, one of the key aspects of Spark in that all of Spark is written in Scala and really sort of the foundation of the Scala data collections is, is a lot of what's in Spark. And it's this idea of using functional programming concepts to basically operate on immutable data sets and per apply transformations across a distributed cluster. So a lot of what's um, in Spark is, as far as core concepts, actually they borrow a lot from Scala and the functional aspects of Scala. Um, I know that Scala is actually not like a uh, purist functional language, so I'm not purporting that, but there's actually some really very good things as, as far as um, computing and working on large data sets. Uh, Scala is very powerful that, and I think you'll see over time a lot more people are using Scala for big data type problems. 
So if you haven't looked at that, I would also encourage kind of taking a look at that. Taking the next step down, as far as the core components, uh, one of the differentiators with Hadoop, if you worked with Hadoop in the past, you kind of knew that basically core Hadoop gave you MapReduce. And once you needed to do other things, such as you wanted to join, then you probably had to pull in Pig or Hive and these things, all basically uh, hid the MapReduce aspect from you. What Spark actually tries to do is actually have a unified comp distributed computing platform so that you can basically do all of these type of things, streaming, uh, I'll talk about Sp Spark SQL in depth in this talk, uh, machine learning, graph, graph type co uh, computations, those type of things all in one environment that feels familiar and you're not having to pull in all these other tools around the ecosystem to actually get the job done. Uh, the key here in this Spark core, and this is where when, you know, they say, uh, the, well, they don't say, they beat the, 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 the sort record, it's because of this Spark core. And the key is a couple things. First is in the execution model. Spark does a very good job at essentially looking at, a, you know, the job as a whole and understanding where essentially data has to cross network boundaries, right, and do this shuffle. So it takes a, basically it, it optimizes the way to execute these tasks across your cluster. And so it makes sure that it's being very efficient about that and keeping things in memory that will be reused and whatnot. And we'll talk a little bit about that. And then there's the shuffle. The shuffle is this, basically I wanna do a reduce by a key or whatever. Obviously I have to send all the key, all the same keys to the same machine to do that reduce. You're going across the network, okay? So they've done some um, pretty crazy optimizations in there, zero copy techniques and what like, what not. Um, I believe they ported to Netty and even kind of improved on that code uh, pretty recently. So that, that's really where they've sort of about a year ago kind of focused their energy. And then the other one is this idea of Spark does use memory more efficiently. So if you have a, a, a MapReduce job in, in Hadoop, and it actually is a chain of MapReduce jobs. Between those, you're actually flushing all that data out to disk, actually out to replicated disk, and storing it in HDFS, and then reading it back in for the next job as you go through. Uh, Spark actually makes those type of iterative type jobs much more efficient, and it will keep the data in memory as best it can. Uh, and then it also has spill the disk and all those type of things. And the other thing that's really kind of cool about Spark is you as a developer have controls to say, you know what, it was really expensive for me to get to this point in my job. Um, I wanna go ahead and kind of like checkpoint this, uh, what's called an RDD, um, so that it's, it, that it's saved off. And so you, it gives you more controls to kind of control some of that caching. I won't talk about Tachyon, but that's a layer below there where they're actually trying to allow for shared memory across, across a large cluster. Um, that's an area that's sort of in you know, very active development. And then lastly, you can run Spark on um, Hadoop Yarn, Mesos, and uh, as well as they have a standalone clustering technique. And here off to the, uh, I guess the right, is HDFS. One thing I think that's key about Spark is that a lot of people um, have invested already very heavily in Hadoop, and they have you know terabytes of data in HDFS. So Spark actually did one thing really good there is they sort of made HDFS a first-class citizen in, in Spark, and so that you can basically um, start using Spark against your HDFS data uh, without you know having to migrate or any of those kind of things. So it uh, plays very nicely with existing Hadoop installs. Um, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this slide per se, but I think one, one thing that's actually interesting to call out is the, the idea of the Spark master. And remember, I just kind of mentioned that you can have Spark, um, Spark run on Hadoop, Yarn, you can have it run on Mesos or this standalone. And so I, you know, to basically support that, they don't want to have this very complex master that they have to port to all these different environments. So the master in Spark is really just about allocating resources, right? Scheduling tasks out on workers. And the smarts of like which tasks need to be executed, how many tasks, that sort of thing, actually happens out on your client application, right? Which is called the Spark driver. And that's the thing that essentially looks at the, transform the data transformations you're applying in your Spark job. All the different tasks, if I'm doing a join or reduce by, um, and it, it then essentially delegates the, the, the scheduling of those tasks to the master, but the actual smarts of determining what needs to be executed 
uh, happens uh, on your client and in the um, uh, what's called the Spark driver. So I think that's one difference that's key about the Spark. The other one that I think is actually worth calling out too is the fact that the, the worker node will spin up a single executor for the job, okay? Um, so unlike MapReduce, which every task, every reducer and every map task ends up being a full JVM process, this, the executor, every job, so my job would be this MySpark app over there, gets an executor spun up once, and then the tasks are kind of reused and, and executed in this executor. Um, and it's not unheard of in Spark to have executors with like 90 gig heaps and things like this. Like these things are beasts. Uh, and, they, and they're you know, really designed to basically um, perform all the tasks needed for a Spark job. This slide, I'm a little bit on the fence. I really just wanted to call out that the, essentially you have a lot more native operators built into the framework. So filters and, and maps and joins and all those type of things. Um, but on the flip side, a lot of the really good things about Hadoop, the idea of moving computation to data instead of your data to the computation, all those still things still actually kind of still exist in Spark. They do it a little bit differently, but the idea is the same. And the other one, obviously why I think Hadoop and MapReduce and all these things actually you know, really took off is the fact that if you're, if you're performing a huge computation job and um, one of the tasks fails, right, the job doesn't, the job doesn't fail, right? You, you, you could be, you know, uh, back when I worked at Dotchess Group here in Austin, we'd have jobs that did uh, crazy things with term vectors and they'd run for hours, right? And if one task failed, you wouldn't want all that computation to be lost. So uh, Hadoop built in the idea of fault tolerance and um, being able to basically replay the, just the task that failed and things like that. So Spark has the same idea because that problem, you know, is very much essential to being able to compute on big data. Okay, so now I want to get into kind of, since this is a solar conference, uh, some of the more interesting things of actually like how to integrate solar and Spark. And um, one of the uh, kind of the more interesting ones, but at the same time, maybe not be as applicable to everybody, is this idea of actually treating solar as a Spark SQL data source, okay? And, and the idea here is actually Spark SQL is a little bit of a misnomer in the fact that what they're trying to do is essentially um, provide this, this framework for operating on data frames. And a data frame kind of comes from the, the, the Python uh, data science world. And the idea there is that is it's, a, um, it's structured data that has a schema, right? Rows and columns that has a schema. And then you're doing some sort of manipulation on it, and we'll, we'll see some of those later today. Uh, it does also support SQL, but really what the Spark core, uh, Spark SQL core is trying to do is to provide um, a uh, logical plan optimizer, right? So they, they, they essentially will look at how the operations you're providing to your data frame and be that in R or Python, uh, what have you, and then actually um, figure out what's the ba best way to execute those operations on the data frame. So it really is just this sort of, um, uh, if you will, very sophisticated query planner. Um, and they realize in Spark that people have a lot of different data sources, right? Their data spread all over, in, 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 especially in large organizations. And so, you know, you could have your Cassandra and Hive and HBase and, and lots of JDBC data sources, right? And then, and then Solar. And so the idea is that the Spark SQL publishes this idea of a data source API, right? And so I went and part of this uh, open source project that I'll show you later actually e implements the data source API in terms of solar. And so one of, the, one of the things it does is allows you to actually pull data into Spark from solar. And you might think, well, why do I want to do that? Um, sort of in my day job at LucidWorks, I, I meet a lot of organizations that more and more their mission critical data is actually in solar, um, but they don't always want to just keep it in solar, okay? So I mean, first thing I'll say about this is don't use this if solar's meeting your needs as far as computation. But if you have data in Hive and a couple relational databases and you want to actually 
bring in some data from solar, this is actually, this will be a good thing to use because Spark SQL makes it so that every data source then can be accessed and be operated on using SQL or this DSL for data manipulation. So, and I've showed some Java code here. I think, I think that's Java, yeah. Um, also, I'll show Scala in a second. But let's, let's walk through kind of a, how this works just so we get the feel. So what we want to do is we actually want to, and again, in our Spark Driver app, uh, that's, that's running code that's, uh, you know, um, determining what tasks need to be executed and whatnot. And what we're going to do is we're going to read data out of this social data collection. Uh, and I may even give a little demo uh, of, of reading some tweets for this conference. We'll see. Uh, but anyway, so we want to read data out of this social data collection. In this case, we actually just want to read it all, right? We want to do a big table scan and, and pull all the data back into Spark and do whatever we're going to do with it. Maybe we're going to join it with some Hive data or whatever. Um, and so I have two shards. This is, you know, maybe a small collection or whatever, but I have two shards. And so by default, the, the uh, data source for solar basically partitions that into just two readers, right? Two parallel readers. Now, if you need to basically bring back data from the social data collection uh, in, a, in a sort of top end type sorted uh, query, then this approach won't work because as you can see, I have two different partitions and those are out running on different nodes in the Spark cluster and they're querying these, these shards uh, independently, right? And so the, the global sort order that you get from a normal distributed query in solar doesn't really apply here because you can see we're doing distrib false. But remember, um, sorting and shuffling and all those things, Spark actually does quite well as well. So uh, if you need eventually to get down to some sort of sorting, you can also do that in Spark, but that's kind of a sidebar. The point is that essentially these guys are reading into the, into the shard um, and it's effectively streaming the results back using some of the streaming results stuff in SolarJ. And it's also, um, we're probably all aware that if you, if you do sort of the, the normal paging through solar as you get deeper and deeper into that role, uh, result set, that doesn't perform very well. Um, and so it uses the distributed cursor marks to actually go all the way through all the docs there. Okay, and one thing that's different, and Eric Erickson is going to give a talk tomorrow on the streaming aggregations in solar. Uh, this is different than that because this can actually access you know, any stored fields, you can uh, essentially execute any solar query and then pull the results back using this technique, right? But um, you're probably thinking, well, you know, this is, this is pretty limiting because now I have basically just two readers of my solar data collection, but what if I have this large Spark cluster and I want to like really ramp up the parallelism? So one of the other things we do in the, in this data, data source implementation is this idea of essentially having an intra shard split. So here I'm just saying, okay, um, I happen to have in my Spark cluster, say, let's say four tasks available. And, in, and so I want to basically use all of those to read into solar. And this is pretty common stuff. Like, you know, people have been doing this like in scoop with against JDBC databases forever, right? Basically splitting each shard by some field that you can actually cal calculate a sub range into that, into that width. And the example I gave here is maybe some ASCII keyword field or whatever that I'm essentially, as you can see, the split field there uh, is doing some range queries um, to, to effectively allow me to have parallel uh, Spark tasks reading out of each shard in parallel. And that's how you can really ramp up the parallelism. Um, one of the key things here is that the, um, what I was going to show is that the, um, split field can be string based or it can be uh, even the version field. The version field is a little bit, uh, can be imbalanced because basically when documents flow in, you can get spikes if you get a lot of uh, documents flowing in at one time. Yeah. Um, you know, well, in this example, it's probably pretty small, but if you're reading tens of millions of rows, then you want more parallelism in your Spark, you know, because... Spark can do a lot of sorting in query pretty fast Sure, but this is getting more, basically, reader heads 
pulling data out of solar, right? So it's kind of just ramping up the number of threads that are reading out of solar at one time. Um, so yeah, obviously solar can execute the query without that a lot faster, but can it read off one thread faster, right? So in this case, you get two readers, but uh, you know, so how we use an infusion is actually maybe like 30, right? Because again, um, you try to essentially use as much of your Spark cluster uh, um, executor tasks that are available at one time with, obviously you don't want to bog down solar because if you get too many of these, so then you're, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And so this is, and this is optional. And the other thing I was going to say is that um, when it's planning the partitions, because essentially the the code in in the sol solar data source actually has to tell Spark I want four partitions, right? It has to say, hey Spark, here are the partitions. Go go execute them across the cluster. So in that coming up with how many partitions I have, there's some balancing. So if I see a split that's like too big, you know, I could see 100 docs, 100 docs, and then a million docs, I'd want to balance that million docs by actually changing the ranges there for that split field. So there's a little bit of a calculation. So it has a little bit of an upfront cost, but the idea there is that when you're reading millions of rows, that upfront cost kind of washes out and because you have more readers and pulling that data back. So um, let's, uh, one of the cool things I think about Spark is actually it comes with this REPL shell that you can essentially fire up and immediately start kind of doing interactive data analysis and pulling data from solar or whatever. So let me see if I can, I can um, um, do that really quick. If not, I can definitely give demos later. But uh, I want to pull up. Okay. So let's move that over there so I can see what I'm doing. Okay, so this is the Fusion app. And uh, to save me actually going in and setting up uh, the, um, the Twitter, we have a Twitter data source uh, right here. Basically, I have to go in and put in keys and things like that. Um, I didn't want to do that while we're doing this query. But I have some basically some basic filters in place. Lucene Soul Rev, so, and then I pulled them in. But let's go ahead and start it off again and bring in some, some tweets from this conference. People aren't very active, by the way, uh, I've noticed. And then, okay, so we, we have some more, I think, documents that came in. Okay, 213. Okay, so now what I want to do is I'm going to go ahead and over in my shell, and I'm sorry, that doesn't appear as nice as I thought it would. But um, I'm, a, I'm effectively going to use some Scala code here up top, and I'm going to load up a, where'd my thing go? There. My, my displays aren't mirrored, which is why I have to do it this way. OK, so you can't really see down there, especially in the people in the back. But what I'm effectively doing is I'm using the Spark SQL API to load the solar data source. I give it a couple options, which are uh, you know the zookeeper host and then the name of the collection, which I called rev. Okay, and then so that comes in, and one of the things I can do with that is I can print the schema. So as I mentioned, I, mean, I can't type. <laughs> It would have been better if I mirrored displays. What did I, what did I type? I missed the T. <laughs> of course I did. OK. OK, so one of the things it does is it actually goes out and uses the, the Solar Schema API and pulls back this data. OK, um, and now I have all this information. I can do any number of interesting things that a data scientist might do. Um, one of the ones, and this is about as um, complex of SQL as I, uh, as I can write. Let's get that right there. Yeah. Okay, so this is actually, for the solar people, you're like, oh man, that's like a simple, um, oops, 
That's a simple facet query. And of course, I have an error in it. But uh, I might have it in my Spark shell. Let's just see if it's in history there. No. All right. Well, given the display issues, I'm going to go ahead and bail on that so we can get through a few more slides. But if you want to see kind of this in action, um, it's really easy to get, get going uh, by yourself, or I can kind of show you while, while we're at the conference. But essentially what I was going to do is execute this SQL, right? So, so effectively I've read in the rev uh, tweets, and then I registered as a temp table. That's all using the Spark SQL API. And then now I can use it in SQL. Again, that's about as complex as my SQL gets. Um, and that's obviously a simple faceting query on uh, username, like who's doing posts. But then also you can notice that if you don't want to use SQL, you, there's a, this, again, this sort of DSL around data frames that allow you to do sort of relational type operations. Um, and that's their, those two are equivalent. I don't know which one you like. But the idea here is now um, Solar, as being a Spark SQL data source, you can join this up with other data just using straight SQL, bring it in. And again, it, it does all the things that um, I talked about as far as splitting shards and reading data as efficiently as it can. Uh, one last thing, and I borrowed this from the Databricks folks. I hope they don't mind. But basically, <clears throat> the thing of notice here that's sort of interesting is that if you kind of go out and hand code uh, your own RDD um, and Java and Scholar, you want to do it in Python, you kind of get this performance. And this is just a representative. But if you let, if you essentially use the data frame API and you let Spark SQL optimize that access, the, basically all languages have parity, right? And that was sort of the point I wanted to make about the, the Spark SQL being this sort of logical plan optimizer and then execu executing it out on the Spark cluster. So, okay. Um, all of this stuff that I've been talking about so far, actually, we use in Fusion at Lucidworks, right? And um, sort of the core there is that we have machine learning algorithms and things like that that we execute on Spark. Um, one of them that we do is this idea, and, and as search people, you're probably very familiar with this, is that um, as people use the search application, use your search engine, they're searching and then clicking on documents, and they're leaving signals of sort of, you know, um, not essentially, you know, is the search engine returning results that uh, are relevant to your users? What we do in Fusion is actually we take those signals, we store them in Sol, we take those signals and we compute these sort of aggregations, uh, various complexity aggregations uh, using Spark to, to basically feed back into the search engine to, to, to boost certain documents based on which queries using all of this kind of uh, signals that users are leaving it around. Then we also do recommendations and that sort of thing. Again, sort of all using Spark behind the scenes. So <clears throat> one of the things I want to talk about, and this is kind of getting away from solar for a second, but is this idea of um, you know, how does Spark achieve uh, you know, the, you know, what's the secret sauce inside of Spark? And it's what's called a resilient distributed data set, the RDD. So let's walk through very quickly um, how it works in Spark, and I think it will highlight a couple key things about RDDs in Spark. And the first is, there's a little bit of Scala. Uh, don't worry about the syntax. I'm pretty sure you can kind of follow it even if you don't get all the cool operators in Scala. But essentially, at the first level, we're, um, we're reading and I have a cool little animation, so I'll walk you through the code. So we're essentially reading this text file that's stored out in HDFS. And since it's out, out in HDFS, you have splits. Presumably, this data is very large, and we want to do word count on it. Um, I guess I could have come up with a better example. But the idea is now we have partitions around HDFS that we want to read to. And again, Spark does a very good job at moving the computation to where the data is. So these. Uh, partitions, essentially where Spark's going to run this RDD code, is out where these blocks are local on HDFS, okay? And so the first thing it does is this basically flat map operation which splits 
uh, a line by white space, not very sophisticated tokenization, um, but you could use Lucene for more. Uh, and it splits that into various words of each line, right? And so we have quick brown fox, and you kind of get that. And one thing to notice is that this oper both these operations essentially now happen in the same executor task, right? So this is all local in memory, goes very fast, okay? The next thing is that we're actually going to map um, these words into key value pairs, right? And that's the, that's this, uh, sorry, the Spark map operation, which uh, maps it into key value pairs, the key being the word and the uh, value there is one. And we're gonna do word count, so we'll sum those up. Okay, so now, this is what's called in Spark a narrow transformation, right? That we're basically operating on all this data um, in, in Spark in a functional way that essentially doesn't have to cross machine boundaries, there's no network, it all happens in memory, and it just uh, essentially moves the data down the line. Okay, now the last step being a reduce by key where we actually wanna sum up to come up with the word count is now we do have to send those keys all to the same reducer and uh, effectively make it so that we can count those up, right? This is the key um, aspect of MapReduce or Spark or whatever. And so this is that shuffle across machine boundaries. So now let's imagine what happens when, uh, for whatever reason, we lost this lower partition in purple, right? Um, and so Spark has to decide, well, what am I gonna do? Am I gonna just start the job over and redo it? No, because we've already done a lot of work around the, so we essentially, Spark needs to heal that partition and basically bring it back into the computation. Okay, and the way they do that is this idea of resilient distributed data set, okay? And so, um, if you only kind of take one thing away from this, that basically this is probably the slide to look at if you're interested in Spark. So essentially, Spark looks at an RDD as a read-only partition collection of records, right, with fault tolerance, okay? And uh, an RDD can either be created by an external system, we already saw with solar, or using some transformation. As we saw, like the map, uh, we transformed into a key value pair, right, using that map transformation. And the key is that Spark, as RDDs change, it keeps track of essentially how, that, how it became to be, okay? And that's, that's what they call lineage. So it keeps track, every RDD knows how it was created, okay? Um, and that lineage essentially allows that if we lose a partition, like in my example, that essentially it can replay that lineage of transformations just for that, just for that particular partition that was lost. And the, uh, the other idea is that, okay, uh, as you're doing all these transformations and the lineage gets long and complicated, maybe you're doing some sort of page rank algorithm where right, you're really deep into the iterations, uh, you as a developer can actually say, all right, it's pretty expensive for me to get here. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and persist that so that if I do lose um, the partition at this point, I just basically go back to that persisted checkpoint. right? So that give, they give you the kind of controls for that in Spark. And then, then the other one is like, you can control just much just like you can in Hadoop the, the partitioning scheme um, and, and that sort of thing. And we actually use uh, in, the, um, in this project, we use custom partitioning to actually during Spark streaming. So um, now I'm going to move kind of quickly to one of the other kind of key use cases, which is the idea of um, we've already seen how we read data out of solar into Spark, but now let's actually see how to get data into, into solar from Spark. And one of the kind of common ways is this idea of using a streaming type technology. Um, similar to Storm, Spark has a streaming solution. But the way they look at it is to basically say, uh, again, uh, a stream basically gets broken down into a discretized, uh, discretized stream, which is essentially a sequence in RDDs. And the idea there is, you can imagine our Twitter example, uh, as tweets are flowing in, I want to essentially take every second, however many tweets come in in a second, I don't know, is that 10,000 or something? Um, take those and treat them as, as a single RDD. Again, it's partition around the cluster. And then process it using all of the same RDD stuff. And so that's kind of a key to Spark, is that um, uh, pretty much once this discretized stream uh, becomes an RDD, then you can do all the other things you've done with it, right? Um, uh, that you can do with RDDs. So uh, that's really, I'd say, the difference between Spark 
is that they try to make it so that RDD is kind of the kernel of how things work. And, and you'll see it in the literature sort of known as kind of micro-batching. And so we do, um, uh, or we, the, the solar project works very well with streaming in the sense that it builds some essential support, uh, you know, a library, I call it solar support, for you to index data into solar. Uh, from Spark. And in this case, this is an example of essentially indexing data into solar um, using tweets. And the idea here is that out of the box, Spark gives you sort of a Twitter uh, receiver that knows how to use the Twitter J API to bring data into a Spark streaming job. You perform a, you know, a number of operations and then eventually send it out to solar using this project, right? So and it saves a lot of work and we do all kind of the heavy lifting of you know, making sure that happens efficiently and whatnot. Um, this, this shows some operations you might do. This again, this is Java. Um, others may use Scala, but uh, the idea is the same that you can essentially uh, build an ETL pipeline uh, for indexing solar from Spark using this project. Um, this is meant to show just there's a lot of ugly code behind the scenes, especially when you use Spark uh, in, in uh, Java directly. So we can ignore that one. Uh, one thing I do want to mention is this idea of a, of a shard partitioner. So as data flows in and you're sending it to solar, you can actually start to root documents based on where they eventually want to be as far as their shard assignments, right? So, I, so I've implemented uh, a custom partitioner in Spark that allows you to stream. And the idea here is that solar provides a very efficient way to send docs, to stream docs into, into solar using concurrent update solar client. And um, if you then partition your stream to that, then essentially you're constantly just streaming data into solar. There's no batching. Uh, there, you know, it has an internal buffer, but it's very short window. Uh, for actually sending data into solar. And because the key with these streaming operations is that you actually have to be able to process data in your, in your streaming job um, quick enough to keep up with how fast it's coming in, right? That's just the, sort of the key of streaming. And so using all of this shard partition, you can directly route documents to um, the, essentially, the Spark task that is streaming out to the correct leader, right? And so this is... Uh, a pretty interesting approach. It saves you trying to do uh, batching and things like that that you would kind of have to do with uh, cloud solar client and things like that. But this is also Zookeeper aware. It goes into Zookeeper and, and whatnot. So um, I am getting close to out of time. So a couple other things. This isn't as much interesting for a lot of people because a lot of people don't like to store term vectors in their index because it's very expensive in terms of disk utilization, but if you do, it has tools for basically allowing you to go ahead and pull the term vectors directly out of solar and then pass them on to Spark ML. Uh, it also has this idea, and Grant mentioned it, kind of alerts. So if you, you have a set of queries and you want to uh, execute those queries against documents as they flow through your system, such as in streaming, to do matching and alerting type stuff, it has a basic framework for that. <clears throat> One thing with these um, mics is you can't cough. <laughs> okay, and so, you know, if that's of interest, you can definitely take a look at that. So, lastly, to kind of get started, and I apologize, there won't be a lot of time for questions, but you can grab me anytime during the, um, during the conference, is it's out on GitHub. It's just called Spark Solar. Uh, just go ahead and clone it, CD into there, and then you, it's a Maven-based project, and you can just build it. And then I have a blog up there that'll kind of walk you through a little Twitter scenario and all that. So um, with that, I think we're out of time. And so we just enjoy the rest of the conference and thanks for attending. <laughs>